Hello and welcome to the third installment of UTDTG development. In the last episode, I talked about my experimentation with different ways of generating my world tiles. This episode, if you haven't picked up from the title and thumbnail, will be focusing primarily on how I improved the implementation that I settled in in a previous episode by swapping from floating point numbers to using fixed point numbers. Before we jump into the meat of this video, I would like to thank my very first patron. You're amazing, and I'm incredibly grateful for your support, but also mock infuriated at the fact that you happen to subscribe at the sneaky beaky tier before I finish this video. So now I've got to go through and hide your username somewhere in the video. And just because you're the first patron I've ever had, I'm going to hide your name uh, however many times you see on the screen right now, and uh, I guess have fun trying to find your name hidden throughout this video. Anyway, link in the description for anyone else that wants to support, and on with the show. In the last part, I settled on a modified version of waveform collapse that would work on hexagons, primarily by breaking them out into sub-meshes that would then be reconstructed into a larger mesh based on the neighboring hexagons. There's a link in the description to the previous episode if you need to catch up or didn't see it in the first place. A key factor in that video was my desire to remove as many duplicate vertexes as possible when constructing the mesh. This reduces both GPU memory and frame rendering time after the world has actually been generated, at the trade-off of taking significantly longer to generate the meshes to begin with, since the deduplication code needs to be run on top of the actual generation code itself. But another benefit of this approach was that it also allowed for certain seams to be removed from the world, since the meshes would round their vertexes when being rotated and could end up with vertexes that should have been the same place, not quite lining up resulting in a noticeable seam. With the approach of moving vertexes at a certain distance from each other, these seams would disappear since the vertexes would be merged together, meaning that they actually share a single edge, as opposed to having two edges very close together that may not be distinguishable. To remove the duplicate vertexes, I use a hash map that takes the vertex position and color as its key and the index in the vertex array as its value. This allows me to reuse a vertex if it's already in the mesh, or add the vertex into the array, and then insert it into the hash map. In order to allow for vertexes within a certain range of each other to be removed, I needed to reduce the resolution of the mesh so that each vertex could be thought of as falling into cells on a grid. If two vertexes were to fall into the same cell, they would be considered to be the same vertex and therefore could be ignored when inserting into the map. This has the effect of allowing for vertexes to be quickly and efficiently rounded by distance, as opposed to needing to iterate through all possible vertexes. But one limitation of this approach is two vertexes that are actually really close together can end up being moved apart if they happen to fall just either side of the grid boundaries. At first, I was generating this grid by rounding the vertices F32s to a decimal place. At first the hundreds, then the thousands and using a corresponding grid size that a change in the place that I was rounding to would indicate a movement in the grid. This, however, had some drawbacks, mostly that floating point errors would accumulate over time and could cause issues with things like rotation not resulting in vertexes that should be on top of each other being on top of each other. Some of the error of floating point numbers probably could have been mitigated if I'd remembered when I was still working with floating point numbers, something that I think a lot of programmers forget. At least I know it's something I very rarely consider when I'm doing my programming. And that's that just because a number looks nice in decimal doesn't mean it works in binary. This little rule of thumb is easier to demonstrate and more important when it comes to integers. But I'm just going to explain in floating point first because it can be more clear where we get some of these magic numbers from. So I'll just give the common example, 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 equals 0 0.3000, some remaining number. I'll explain why this happens with floats, but I'll go into more detail on why this is important when we get to the integer section. So most people are probably aware, if you have spent any amount of time programming with floating point numbers, that they have an intrinsic error. The super famous one of these is when you open up Python and enter 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2, it gives you an answer of three with some large number of zeros and then a number at the end, depending on if you're in 32 or 64 bit uh, Python, this number will change. But the idea is it's not quite three. The simplest explanation for why this happens is that decimal just doesn't play nice with binary. The slightly longer explanation is that 0 0.1 doesn't have a nice binary fraction. And the closest approximation a 32-bit float can get to 0 0.1 is this abomination of a number. 
and 0.2 also doesn't have a nice binary fraction. And the closest a float can get is this abomination. And so when we combine these two not perfect fractions, you also get this not nice fraction of 0.3 and on and on. What's even more bizarre about this fraction is it's not even the closest approximation that a float can get to 0.3, but this also has a terrible fraction. So you may be wondering why I'm saying fraction but showing decimal numbers, and that's pretty simple. If I showed you the actual fraction, it wouldn't really mean much to your brain since it would just be two large numbers next to each other in order to result in dividing into 0 0.3 you know, so much. So it would approximate to 3 over 10, but not quite. And that doesn't mean much. Whereas a decimal representation is easier for you to ration about how it's not quite, but almost the right number. But just to show you why you need nice fractions, let me show you a super nice fraction that plays well with both binary and decimal. And that's one half. Since a half is literally one over two, it's represented perfectly in binary. So if I was to say one half plus one, I would get exactly 1.5 and so on and so on, as long as I used half fractions. And what this means on a high level, as long as the enumerator and the denominator are both powers of two or made up entirely of powers of two, then we will get a nice fraction that can be represented without any error in a float. And this will become more clear after the next section. So much for a small example. Anyway, back on track. Since I was simply rounding the float to the nearest decimal position, I decided to go away from floating point numbers altogether and just multiply the original value of the mesh by 1000 and convert it to an integer. This saved me constantly having to round the number back to a nice value and therefore sped up the code. However, this also tipped me off to the fact that I was applying my decimal mindset to binary numbers. When I was thinking about it from a more program-centric mindset, I was thinking how would I multiply two numbers together? And that's when I came up with the idea of multiplying by 1024. Since this is a nice power of two, I could simply bit shift my number to the left 10 times. And just to confirm my suspicions about decimal and binary, I decided to make a quick function that multiplied by 1000 and one that multiplied by 1024, and then decompile them and see what the compiler did to, in order to achieve these two multiplications. And to be honest, it's actually one additional instruction to multiply 1024, but they were different instructions, which got me to thinking, well, multiplication is O of n digits. Division isn't O of n. It's slightly higher from my understanding of mathematics. I don't know the exact number. So when I tried rewriting my two functions to being divide by 1000 and divide by 1024, you can see that the divide by 1024 is significantly less instructions than the divide by 1000. The primary reason for this is because if we divide by 1000, we need to make sure that we propagate our carryover to the next number. Whereas if we divide by 1024, we can literally just shift the number over. So as you can see, dividing by 1024 has significantly less instructions than dividing by 1000. The main difference for those that don't understand why the number we're dividing by would have such an impact on the way we go about dividing it has to do with how the numbers are encoded into binary. Because the underlying math doesn't actually care what numbers we are using, since that all functions the same. But as an example, in base 10, when we multiply by t powers of 10, we simply add zeros to the end. And when we divide by powers of 10, at least in integers, we just remove the end digit. Floating point numbers work very similar just by moving the decimal point back and forth. So with our example of dividing by 1000 and dividing by 1024, because 1024 is a power of two, we can simply bit shift the number across rather than needing to make sure that we propagate the non-lined up change across. So hopefully this has clarified why you'll notice a lot of magic numbers in programming that all seem to be related to powers of two. It's almost always faster to use a power of two than something that works well in base 10. And the compiler is very good at finding these optimizations. It's another reason why you should probably rely on the compiler to do the optimizations than trying to write code that you optimize yourself, since you may inadvertently prevent the compiler from seeing some of these optimizations. It was with this insight that I realized that, that by multiplying my float by 1024 and casting it to an int, I was basically just specifying that I wanted the last 10 bits of the integer to represent the quote unquote decimal point in my number. And there just so happens to be a term for that. It's called a fixed point number. Yes, we're finally getting to fixed point numbers like 
10 minutes into this video. And luckily for me, Rust has a fantastic crate called Fixed that lets you create any sized fixed point number that you like. You can simply specify the underlying primitive, U8, U16, U32, U64, U128, or their signed counterparts, and then you specify as the generic how many bits are to the right of the point. This crate is also implemented in such a way that the compiler can do all its magic in order to get any optimization it can see out of the fact that these are binary representations of numbers. But before going into the effort of converting all my code to fixed point numbers, I had to make sure that they were actually faster. So I did some basic benchmarks to make sure that it was all actually faster. Since I'd known from previous testing that the integer multiplied by 1000 was basically twice as fast as a float, but that increase of speed could have been coming from something beyond the fact that the numbers were integers versus floats. It could have been some kind of fractional representation that the fixed point numbers would still need to encode. But after doing some benchmarking, I actually found that fixed point numbers are slightly faster than the integer approach. I suspect this has to do with the fact that when I was doing my integer approach, I had to divide by a thousand any time I did a multiplication that involved numbers that were supposed to be less than one. Otherwise, the fixed multiplier would make the number continue to grow. Whereas the fixed point crate had been built for purpose and probably used some fancy math in order to not be need to apply additional operations in order to bring the numbers back into the correct range. One big drawback that I found when using fixed point numbers is that there was a lack of trig functionality. I needed the sign and cos of the angles around a hexagon in order to rotate my meshes. To get around this, I used Rust to generate F64 calculations for the six angles that I needed. And then I used them to create constants in a lookup table that I could then use to create my fixed point numbers. And no, before anyone goes saying that my speed up came from using a lookup table rather than calculating the sign and cos, I actually benchmarked that as well. And it's slightly slower to use a lookup table than to calculate the sign and cos. This could be because of my dodgy implementation of a lookup table, or maybe calculating them is just much more cache friendly with dedicated hardware, or it just could be that the compiler unrolls my loop and makes its own lookup table with one less level of indirection. So with the ease of floating points and the speed of integers, I went about implementing my waveform collapse approach using floating point numbers. I also took this opportunity to split my waveform collapse out into its own crate and plugin. This was harder than I was expecting, but probably because I tried to generic this crate as much as possible so that it would be usable by other people in other applications beyond just my hexagon game. There are probably some things that I'm going to need to change since they're kind of hacky. Things like the fact that all wave meshes have the same UUID regardless of what their generics are. But I wanted to release this publicly so people could have a closer look at how I've implemented things and maybe even put forward pull requests to help make the crate faster or more feature complete. You can find a link to the plugin in the description and I'll be doing a video going into more detail about how you can use this plugin in your own game in the future. And I promise, unlike my animation plugin, this one won't be abandoned. At least not like immediately after I released it, like I did with that one. With my newly implemented waveform collapse, I have managed to achieve at least a three times speed up and in some cases a five times speed up. A lot of this speed up is from the conversion from floats to fixed point numbers, but some of the speed up at least came from the restructuring of my data structure. Originally, I was generating a hash map, a vertex vector, and an indices vector, and passing them all as independent references. Instead, I now wrap them up inside a mesh builder and use that in order to not have to pass data around constantly. Another thing that probably contributes to why some things get up to a five times speed up is that I made it possible to insert vertices without having them go through the deduplication process. In some of my slower to generate cells, which were the forests, they had a significantly more vertexes than all the others, since the trees also contained large numbers of vertexes. But the thing with the trees is they very rarely shared vertexes with the cell itself or any of its neighbors. So this meant that I wanted a way of inserting trees and rocks and things like that that didn't need to do the deduplication detection, since there was very unlikely that they would be duplicates anyway. So I added a method that lets you just insert them into the vectors without being deduplicated speeding up this code. If you plan on using my waveform collapse plugin, I recommend using a relatively large number of fractional bits. I think there's probably a way to go about making meshes that reduces the need for the accuracy 
simply by making sure that they line up on binary boundaries and stuff like that. But what I found is if you use too few bits, you would end up with very large obvious errors building up. This is in part to do with how the rotation logic is applied, since the sine and cosine are also affected by the low fractional bits. You need to balance this that I use the same fractional error in order to round the vertexes, in order to deduplicate the code. So a lower number of fractional bits will mean larger deduplication amounts. Theoretically, in my test case, there is a maximum of 6,600 vertices and a minimum of around 3,000 vertices. With eight fractional bits, I end up with a mesh with about 3,660 vertexes, which is about a 78% efficiency, but there is big obvious errors everywhere. Whereas with 28 bits of accuracy, I have no noticeable errors whatsoever, and this gives me a mesh of 4,730 vertices. So it's only like 57% efficient. One final thing to consider is the size of your chunks. Since the mesh is calculated as being relative to the chunk center, you can use really high fractional bit numbers when your chunks are small, but you need to make sure that you use lower numbers of fractional bits if your chunks maximum size would exceed the maximum number that can be represented with that number of bits. And with that, we have reached the end of this video where I talk about why I swap to floating point numbers. I do feel that this video got a little bit off track um, towards the end there as I started to talk about the plugin itself, but you'll find a link to the plugin in the description. So hopefully you guys enjoy it. Uh, again, thank you to my Patreon. And if you want to join the patrons, there'll be a link in the description. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe so you don't miss future installments of UTDTG or more information on other content that I create.